Chapter 6. The 1% Club. Commences with a quote by Clive Hamilton and Richard Dennis. The real concerns of yesterday's poor have become the imagined concerns of today's rich. Struggle Street, it seems, has become crowded. The trouble is, the new residents want to build McMansions there. There are a lot of organisations giving varying data and definitions on what it means to be rich or poor in today's world, and their results vary significantly. The most reliable research I've been able to locate comes from a report published by the United Nations, World Distribution of Household Wealth. According to the 2008 report, if you're an adult and your net worth, that's the combined value of everything you own minus your debts, is $2,900 or more, then you are wealthier than half of the world's adult population. In raw figures, you're financially better off than most people. If your net worth is $83,000 or more, then you are amongst the wealthiest 10%, richer than 90% of Earth's adults. Now for the one that really surprised me. What would you guess your net worth would need to be for you to be in the richest 1% of all adults worldwide? to be a member of the much-revered 1% Club. $10 million? $5 million? $1 million? My first guess would have been at least $2 million. Here's the fact. If your net worth is just $691,000 or more, you are in the richest 1% of adults on Earth. The richest 1%. If that's you, you're richer than at least 99 out of every 100 adults on the planet. And if you're in this 1% club, even if you only just scrape in, you are rich. Imagine how comparatively rich you are if your net worth is in the millions, tens of millions or more. When I first realised these facts, it gave some passages in the Bible a very different meaning for me, especially the ones directed at the rich and the blessed. With never-before-seen wealth creation opportunities and the perpetual debut of new communication technologies, it has never been easier for a person to hear about Christ. Ironically, these very same blessings also make it an era where it has never been so difficult to maintain our faith and our relationship with Him. In financial terms, today's Western Christians are the richest group of Christians to have ever lived on the planet. What an incredible responsibility. Of course, we may never have realised just how incredibly rich we are, because one of the mysteries of wealth is that we always know of someone richer than ourselves, and we therefore conclude that we are not really rich. And this can lead us to think, even if only subconsciously, that we don't have enough money. Solomon told us this about 3,000 years ago, when he said that whoever loves money never has enough. We always feel like we would be wealthy or comfortable if only we had just a bit more. I've had years in my life when my family could live very comfortably on less than 10% of my income, and yet I've still wanted to earn more and more. When we read Timothy's advice about the desire for riches, we nearly always think that he wrote it for someone else, for the rich people, but not us, regardless of our financial status. In 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, we read, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. One of the traps that we're lured into is not seeing that we are, in fact, rich. Or maybe, if we're honest, we do know how comparatively rich we are, but we choose to ignore it because it would bring with it a load of guilt and biblically mandated responsibilities for fairness, justice, sacrifice and equality that we just don't want to think about. Having worked in developing countries and alongside people in need here at home, I have seen real poverty. More than a billion people work hard, and I mean hard, all day, every day, just so they can stop by a makeshift roadside store to buy an onion, 
two tomatoes and a bowl of gravelly rice, beans or maize to feed their family dinner and breakfast. Then at sunrise, off they go again. I know many people who feel exceptionally blessed simply because they get two good meals a day. I've spent time with children in orphanages, precious little souls who have absolutely nothing to their name, and yet they pray, Dear God, please help the poor children in the villages tonight. But I also know multimillionaires who display a poor me attitude. A 2002 news poll survey by the Australia Institute clearly showed that even well-off families often feel like they are struggling. The study found that 62% of Australians felt they could not afford to buy everything they really need. Now that's a fair enough complaint for families in the lower income brackets who, in 2002, were earning less than $20,000 or $30,000 a year, but that's not all that the study found. Almost half, 46% of families who had an income of $70,000 a year or more, which was well above average in 2002, also said that they too couldn't afford to buy everything that they really need. So how much do we really need to meet our really needs? How can some families earning $20,000 a year feel that they have all their needs met, while other families earning more than three times that still feel that they have needs that they can't afford? Maybe some of our needs are really just wants. It's a curious trap to be caught in. As Hamilton and Dennis pointed out so well in their book, Affluenza, the real concerns of yesterday's poor have become the imagined concerns of today's rich. Struggle Street, it seems, has become crowded. The trouble is the new residents want to build McMansions there. In 2010, British media entrepreneur Felix Dennis made headlines when he published his Wealth Scale. He defined people as the lesser rich once they reached a net worth of £16 million, about $25 million, and the rich as those who had reached £75 million, that's $115 million. That seems like a pretty high bar to hurdle just to be called rich, but when you realise that Dennis had an estimated net worth of $750 million when he created his wealth scale, it all comes into perspective. It's all relative. The fact is that some people would really struggle to be faithful stewards with the blessing of a $10,000 a year pay rise, while others are so accustomed to dealing with a chain of zeros that they would find it easy to give away a cool $10 million by Wednesday. A few years ago, I was reading some church financial statements and saw a single tithe donation from one family of more than $100 million for their tithe. I don't know about you, but that's more than I carry in my wallet. And yet, as a member of the 1% Club, I'm still very much counted amongst the earth's rich. Maybe you and I can't qualify for Dennis's rich status, but that doesn't mean that we're not rich. The most pressing question that Christians must ask today is no longer, am I rich, but am I Christian? <laughs>